Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Peter Dreyer. I teach at Occidental College in Los Angeles. And I'm the co-author of these two books that you see here on the screen, Baseball Rebels, The Players, People, and Social Movements That Shook Up the Game and Changed America, and Major League Rebels, Baseball Battles Over Workers' Rights and American Empire. Both of these books were published in April, and they're the result of about uh, three years of research, but a lifetime of being a baseball fan, and, uh, and I played in high school and college as well, but I wasn't uh, that great. Um, but I've always maintained my love of the game. And, you know, baseball is, is known as the national pastime. Um, in the last several decades, probably since the 70s, uh, baseball has had to compete with football and basketball and to some extent uh, what we call soccer, what the rest of the world calls football, and hockey for, the, for popularity, for attendance at both uh, amateur and college and professional games. Um, but baseball, more than any other sport, is intertwined with American history. It's, an, it's the oldest uh, game in America, uh, that way, organized game. And it also has a, a lot of mythology around it, uh, a lot of um, interesting characters, uh, and it's got um, a, uh, a way of... Uh, making people feel that they're more American. Um, when immigrants came to this country, uh, beginning in the late 1800s, mid 1800s, uh, baseball was one way that they could become, feel more American. Um, but baseball, like every other institution in America, is also intertwined with some of the uglier aspects of American life, particularly racism and um, economic injustice. Uh, and uh, American militarism. Uh, and it's also intertwined with the movements, the great movements of beginning in the late 1800s that sought to make America a more democratic and fair and equal society um, around issues of race, around issues of workers' rights and labor, around issues of women's rights, around issues of gender, uh, and homosexuality, and also around issues of America's role in the world, sometimes called uh, foreign policy or empire or imperialism or militarism. And so our books are these two books that I wrote with my co-author, Rob Elias, excuse me, who is a professor of political science at University of San Francisco. Both of these books are uh, our efforts to tell the story of the rebels, the the players and the owners and the sports writers uh, and some managers who uh, who challenged the status quo both in baseball and in the larger society. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and uh, I hope you'll find this uh, interesting. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the issues of, of race in America. Uh, this week was uh, Roberto Clemente Day, and in April we had Jackie Robinson Day uh, in baseball. And there is a, a prevailing story about race and baseball, which is partly myth that I want to talk about. Um, everybody in America probably knows the story of Jackie Robinson. It's been a subject of a number of movies, like 42 a couple of years ago. Lots of books, a couple of plays. Um, a lot of TV shows, including Ken Burns' uh, documentary about Jackie Robinson. Um, and, and most of them, not all of them, but most of them tell the story of two trailblazers. Jackie Robinson, the great athlete with an enormous amount of uh, emotional resilience. And Branch Rickey, the owner of the Dodgers, a great political strategist who had to figure out how to uh, help Jackie Robinson overcome those obstacles. So it's a story of these two great men. And it's partly true, but it's also partly not true. Um, and that, I want to tell that story, the, the not true story, about what really happened to break down the, um, the racial segregation in American baseball. Uh, Jackie Robinson came on the scene you know, for the Dodgers in 1947. But um, back uh, after the Civil War and during the Civil War, 
there were a generation of black leaders in America, uh, one of whom was this guy named Octavius Caddo, who were active in trying to bring about more equal rights for uh, former slaves uh, and slaves themselves. They were abolitionists. He was a real Renaissance man. He lived in Philadelphia. And he was a pioneer in the battle for racial integration, for education for African Americans, uh, getting voting rights for African Americans in Philadelphia. Um, but for the purposes of this uh, of our book and this talk, uh, he was also the founder and the captain and the star player of a black baseball team called the uh, the Black Pythians, um, and uh, they were. Uh, mostly comprised of reasonably educated African Americans in Philadelphia, and they played other black teams. Um, and while he was engaged in politics and uh, and uh, doing what he could to address issues of abolition, uh, Cato was also uh, somebody who uh, used baseball to try to uh, promote more uh, equal rights and civil rights. Um, they had a, they were a great team, and um, after the 1867 season in Philadelphia, uh, Cato petitioned the, the Pennsylvania chapter of the National Association of, uh, of Baseball Players, which was one of the first leagues, organized leagues, uh, to allow the Pythians to join the league, uh, and they wouldn't even give them a hearing. Um, so despite the fact that uh, they were a great team, they weren't allowed to play in the white league. They weren't even voted. 265 white teams were allowed into that league, but not uh, the Pythians. But uh, he didn't give up. And he kept trying to get uh, white teams to play the Pythians to see how they would uh, size up against uh, the better white teams. Um, and he actually was successful in that. And he arranged for uh, his team to play, uh, attracted a lot of white and black uh, fans to come to the games. They won some of the games, they lost some of the games. But the important point for history was that it was one of the first times where black players were treated, if not as equals, as at least talented enough to be on the same field. And at the time that was considered uh, a victory. Um, uh, in 1871, four years later, Caddo was uh, assassinated. Here's a, cart, a, a, a painting of that on the right. Uh, when he was trying to um, get people to register to vote for uh, an election, a mayoral election in Philadelphia. So he was a martyr to the cause of, of, uh, of black rights. But he, he saw baseball as an avenue, as a vehicle for uh, giving black people in America pride in themselves and helping to educate white people that blacks were equal in both uh, their baseball talents and in other ways as well. And there were black players, uh, even though Jackie Robinson is often called the first black player in the major leagues, there were black players in uh, professional, what we now call major league baseball, wasn't called that back then. Um, and one of them was uh, Fleetwood Walker, who's a catcher, the first black ball player in what we now call the major leagues in the 1880s, before the Jim Crow system uh, enveloped baseball. And after his uh, career was over, which I'll mention in a second, uh, he became uh, a black uh, activist in, um, in civil rights in the late 1800s. He, had, he was an inventor of uh, both artillery equipment and film, and he opened an opera house. And uh, he was an empresario, he was an entrepreneur. Um, so that's Fleetwood Walker on the left. On the right, in the middle, is a guy named um, Bud Fowler, um, who played uh, on a number of teams. He actually grew up in Cooperstown, New York, of all places, where baseball was allegedly, but mythically, uh, invented by Andrew Doubleday. And he played on a number of, uh, of all-white teams until the uh, segregation entered baseball. Um, and just uh, last year, he was uh, inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, and so th these two players, among others, played on otherwise all-white teams 
and uh, did very well. But uh, then this guy shows up, Cap Anson, um, who was uh, the the uh, captain of the Chicago White Stockings, now called the Chicago White Sox. Um, and he was a leader uh, among baseball, white baseball players, to basically ban blacks from baseball. And he was able to succeed in doing that um, in the, uh, the late 1800s, which is why Fowler and Fleetwood Walker were no longer allowed to play. Um, he basically said, if any black players play on another team, we will boycott, his team will boycott the game. And the, uh, the leaders of the league went along with it. So uh, he's in the Hall of Fame. He was a great athlete, but he was also a segregationist. Um, and if anybody um, uh, gets credit for baseball segregation or the shame of it, uh, it's this guy, Cap Anson. And if you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, you'll see lots of things about him. But uh, on his plaque at the Hall of Fame, it doesn't say he was the leader of the baseball segregation movement. Um, it talks about his statistics as a, uh, a player and a, and a manager. So having been segregated, African-Americans started their own league. And uh, the key figure in that is a guy named Rube Foster, who was a star pitcher in the early 20th century. Uh, he created the first Negro League, uh, organized league, professional league in the 1920s, called the Negro National League, or it later became a, a Negro American League. Uh, he also became a highly successful manager an executive and owner of uh, black teams. And he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1981. There were no blacks in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2% until Satchel Page got in in the 1970s. And uh, one of the people who deserves some credit for making that happen is Ted Williams, the great Boston Red Sox uh, batter, slugger, who in his uh, induction speech to the Hall of Fame in the 1966 uh, basically said it's time to allow African-Americans, the great players. He knew how great some of them were because he played against them in, uh, in barnstorming games. Uh, Rube Foster um, was uh, in, in the Hall of Fame in 1981. Somebody who's not in the Hall of Fame, but maybe should be, is this guy on the right named Frank Sykes. Frank Sykes was um, uh, in the Negro League as a pitcher. Um, he was a pretty good pitcher. Uh, he went to dental school at Howard University, and he later became a dentist. But while he was a pitcher uh, in the Black Leagues, um, he fought for better pay and um, better working conditions for the players. Um, and in the 1920s, there was a famous uh, trial called the Scottsboro Boys Trial, where uh, nine African-American teenagers were falsely accused of raping two white women on a train. Um, in Alabama, and they were brought to trial. They were convicted by an all-white jury, despite the fact that there was no evidence except the two women accused them. Um, it turns out we've now learned that they were prostitutes and that they were uh, they, they did not uh, they were not raped or even had sex with any of those boys, but uh, and it was young men. But that's uh, how they were accused. And there was a long trial. It got international attention. There were marches and protests all over the country called Free the Scottsboro Boys. Um, and in their, one of their trials, Frank Sykes um, stood up and, uh, uh, and said that uh, there were plenty of African-Americans in this little town in Alabama who could be on, on the jury. And he protested that they weren't on the jury. Uh, that was a very risky thing for an African-American man to do back in the 1920s. He could have been lynched. He could have had his house burned down. He could have had his uh, dental practice uh, office burned down. But he did it, and he was outspoken and very courageous for doing that. Eventually, he moved to Baltimore um, from Alabama and, and uh, started his dental practice all over again. But there were great stars in the Negro Leagues. Um, uh, Josh Gibson, the great catcher and slugger, uh, Satchel Paige, perhaps the greatest pitcher in the history of baseball, uh, and Oscar Charleston, one of the great, uh, one of the great fielders and, and hitters in Negro League baseball. 
And if you were an African American in America in 1920s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, you knew about them and some of the other stars in the Negro Leagues. Uh, but if you were a white American and you were reading uh, the mainstream white newspapers, you probably uh, didn't hear about these, uh, these, these athletes unless they came to your hometown and played in an exhibition game against your local semi-pro team or even a, a team of white all-stars, which they often did and, and usually beat them, usually beat the major league white players in these exhibition games. Um, so they were basically invisible to most of America, even though to black Americans, they were, uh, they were heroes. Um, some people say that Josh Gibson was the black Babe Ruth. Other people say that Babe Ruth was the white Josh Gibson. Uh, he was that good. Um, but there were some sports writers who did believe that uh, baseball segregation was a mistake uh, and that it should be uh, dismantled. Uh, and two of the most important were these two columnists, Haywood Brune, um, who was a syndicated columnist for uh, hundreds of newspapers around the country in the 30s and 40s, and Jimmy Powers, who uh, wrote a column, a sports column for the New York Daily News, the largest newspaper in America, um, uh, and who was very outspoken uh, in 1933, both of them gave, uh, wrote columns and gave uh, talks to the Baseball Writers Association that basically said that um, it was time if, if Joe Lewis, could, if white people could cheer for Joe Lewis as heavyweight champion and African Americans like Jesse Owens could be, and others, including Jackie Robinson's brother, Mac, could represent the United States in the Olympics. Uh, it seems silly for African Americans not to be able to play in the national pastime. And they were crusaders in their columns. Uh, and that was rare among white sports writers at the time uh, to integrate baseball. Uh, but perhaps the most you know, influential and important uh, right, sports writers who were part of that crusade were the sports writers for the, the many African-American uh, newspapers. Every major city in America had a black newspaper. Some had more than one. Some of them were dailies, some of them were weeklies. Um, and they, uh, they not only covered the Negro Leagues, uh, but they also crusaded for integration. Uh, and among the most important were uh, Wendell Smith, the guy on the left who wrote for the Pittsburgh Courier, probably the most influential black newspaper in the country. It wasn't just read in Pittsburgh, it was read all over the country. The guy in the middle is a guy named Joe Bostic, who wrote for the Amsterdam News, and Sam Lacey on the right, who wrote for the uh, Baltimore African American newspaper. Um, and so they, they, uh, they would interview white players and ask them, how would you feel about having black teammates? And they wrote columns and, and investigative reports saying that most white players were okay with that. I'm sure that you know many of the players from the South, and there were quite a few, were not okay with it, but they basically tried to make the case that America was ready to integrate its national pastime. And even the many of the players on the teams in the major leagues would uh, be willing to do that. Um, another important part of this crusade was a guy named Lester Rodney, who was the sports editor of the Daily Worker, which was the newspaper of the Communist Party, which was never very big, but in the 1930s, it didn't have a following. And he was actually quite a, a, an influential figure. Um, and he was relentless in his columns uh, and in uh, the articles that, uh, that the paper covered um, to get uh, Major League Baseball to integrate. Uh, he and the black uh, sports writers for the black papers would send telegrams to the owners and to the commissioner of baseball, uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, and say, why don't you give black players tryouts for these teams? Um, they would uh, they would expose the hypocrisy of, uh, of 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 people talking about baseball as a national pastime where all American boys can can dream about being major league players, but a significant number of them who were African Americans couldn't do that. They would organize petitions in front of baseball games and get people that had over a million signatures on petitions uh, demanding the integration of baseball. Uh, they lobbied politicians, um, 
And as I said, they interviewed white ball players uh, and managers uh, who told them that they would, most of them would be, ex would accept uh, black teammates on their teams. Um, so the, um, probably the biggest obstacle to integrating baseball uh, in the 20th century until Jackie Robinson was Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was the commissioner of baseball. He was often called the czar of baseball because he was very powerful. The owners hired him in 1919 after the Black Sox scandal, uh, the corruption scandal where the Chicago White Sox uh, uh, fixed the uh, World Series and lost it. Um, and he had almost dictatorial control. And he was a, a committed segregationist. Um, he would say publicly that there's no ban on black players in the major leagues. It was up to each team. But everybody knew, and the sports writers knew, and they said it in their stories, that there was a, a gentleman's agreement that enforced segregation uh, and would have punished any uh, owner that hired a black player. Um, Another key figure in this uh, is Paul Robeson, who in the 1930s and 40s was probably the best known African-American in the country and around the world, perhaps along with Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion. Uh, and he was an outspoken uh, progressive. Uh, he was one of the few uh, African-American movie stars at the time. And he was on Broadway. He sang opera. He sang in over 50 different languages. Um, he was a leftist, uh, and the black sports writers uh, asked him to come to a meeting of the major league owners in 1943 in Chicago and to talk to them about the need for um, to integrate baseball. The guy on the right in that picture there is Wendell Smith, the reporter for the, the columnist for the uh, Pittsburgh Courier. Um, and so they did invite him because they, it, was, it would have been hard to say no to somebody as popular and well-known as Paul Robeson. So the owners invited Robeson to come and speak along with some of the owners of, uh, of Negro, League, uh, Negro newspapers, black newspapers. And Robeson basically said, look, if I can play Othello uh, in the theater with a, a all, otherwise all-white cast, then America can integrate its national pastime. Uh, and he spoke for about 20 minutes. There's a transcript of uh, his speech you can find online. It's mentioned in uh, Baseball Rebels. Uh, and Landis had told them, told the owners, don't ask him any questions after he speaks. And they didn't. So he spoke, and then nobody asked him any questions, and he left. But it did get um, a lot of newspaper coverage. And so all these things were ways of keeping this issue on, on the public's mind by drawing media coverage to the hypocrisy of segregation in baseball. Uh, there were protests, uh, mostly by labor unions and civil rights groups back in the 30s and 40s. This is a, a May Day parade in New York uh, by a group of labor unions. You can see that the march itself is integrated and it basically says admit Negroes to big league baseball. That was, they were protesting and uh, they had pickets in front of uh, Wrigley Field and Whiteside and Kaminsky Park in Chicago, Ebbets Field, the Paul Grounds, Yankee Stadium. In New York, they even picketed outside Wrigley Field in Los Angeles, which is where the minor league uh, Los Angeles Angels at the time were playing. Again, this was an attempt to draw attention to, um, to the problem and to, uh, and to rally public opinion. Uh, Bill Beck was a really fascinating character. He was um, the son of the, uh, the president of the Chicago Cubs, and he always wanted to own his own baseball team. And first he, he bought, uh, with, with borrowed money, because he didn't have much of his own, he bought the Milwaukee Brewers, who were then a minor league team. Um, and uh, when they went to spring training in Florida, um, he sat in the black section of the stadium and the sheriff of this little town in Florida came out and said, you can't sit there. And he said, if you don't let me sit here, I'm going to move the team. I'm going to move our spring training. And I'm going to try to get other teams to do that. So the mayor and the police chief left him alone. But it showed that he was a principled person around that issue. So in 1943, 
he claims in his autobiography, Vec as in Rec, that um, he wanted to buy the Philadelphia Phillies, which had gone bankrupt and were for sale. And so he made an offer. He raised some money, mostly from labor unions, actually. He raised money to buy the Phillies. And his plan was to integrate the team uh, and be the first uh, team in the major leagues to have black players from the Negro Leagues. But according to his autobiography, he made a mistake and he told the commissioner what he was going to do, Mount Landis. He got on a train in Chicago to go to Philadelphia to sign the papers to buy the Phillies. And by the time he had got, he got to Philadelphia, uh, Commissioner Landis had already talked to the owner of the Phillies and arranged for someone else to buy the team. Uh, and so Bill Beck did not get the chance to be the, the, the role that Branch Rickey now is uh, famous for, the, the person that integrated Major League Baseball. Now, is this story true? I said it was in his autobiography. There's some dispute about whether it's true. Uh, probably the leading baseball historian of our age, a guy named Jules Teigel, looked at the evidence and said he thought it was true. But it's still controversial because Bill Veck was known to exaggerate about his own life. Um, but there were other people who were fighting this fight as well. Um, the Chicago White Sox during uh, World War II um, used to train at a park in Pasadena, California, which is where I'm talking right now. It's my home um, in Brookside Park. And there you see the, the spring training. Um, and there was a lot of um, agitation to get the White Sox uh, from people in Pasadena and other places to integrate. And so reluctantly, the White Sox allowed uh, two people who grew up in Pasadena to go to uh, a tryout at the White Sox at Brookside Park. One of them was Jackie Robinson, who had uh, who was a, just graduated, who just finished UCLA, um, and Nate Moreland, who was um, a college student uh, in, in Pasadena um, and who was a great baseball player. So they had a tryout, didn't get much media publicity. This is a story in the Pittsburgh Courier, black paper. Didn't get any publicity in the white newspapers. They kept it quiet. Um, apparently they did very well. Jimmy Dykes, the manager of the White Sox, said that, um, that Robinson would uh, be a great star if he was able to play in the, in the major leagues. Um, but uh, they never heard from the team again once they had the tryout. Something happened very similar in, um, uh, in 1945. Um, Isidore Muchnick, the guy on the left, was a left-wing city council member in Boston. Uh, in Boston, they had rules that said you, um, you need a permit if you're going to open your business uh, on, uh, on Sunday and sell liquor on Sunday. And so he threatened the owner of the Boston Red Sox, a guy named Tom Yawkey, that if you don't at least give some black players a tryout, I'm going to make sure that the city council withholds your permit to play baseball on Sunday, which, of course, was the day of the biggest attendance for the, for the Red Sox and every other team. And so, again, reluctantly, um, uh, the, the Red Sox held a tryout at Fenway Park. And with the help of uh, uh, Wendell Smith, they... Um, identified three players that they wanted to try out, or they reluctantly tried out. Sam Jethro, uh, Jackie Robinson, and Marvin Williams, who were all in the Negro Leagues at the time. Same thing happened. They had a tryout. They all did pretty well, but Jackie Robinson really did extremely well during the tryout. Um, and the, uh, the hitting coach of the Red Sox also said he, he could do very well in the major leagues. They had the tryout, and um, they never heard from them again, although Robinson uh, became very friendly with Mudstick for the rest of his life. Um, and uh, so think about this. Uh, the Red Sox were the last team to have a black player in 1959 because the owner, Tom Yawkey, was one of the stronger racists and among the owners in baseball. But they could have been the team that first integrated um, if they had followed up with this tryout in 1945. But it took another two years before um, before that actually happened when the Dodgers hired Jackie Robinson in 1947. Uh, Sam Naham 
was a, a, a little-known character in the history of baseball, although uh, we put him on the cover of our, one of the people that we put on the cover of our book, Baseball Rebels, because I think he deserves to be better known. Um, he was a, uh, a, a, a Jew from a Syrian background, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. In the 1930s, he played both baseball and football at, um, at Brooklyn College. Um, and he um, was an okay pitcher, not a great pitcher. He was okay, but he was good enough to get a contract with the Dodgers. Uh, and then he played for the Dodgers, he played for the Phillies, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals. He had an okay record, but not a great record. But his claim to fame, for purposes of the story, is that during World War II, um, he was sent to overseas and he was with a unit in, on a military base in France. And after the Germans surrendered in 1946, um, the, um, the, the military bases all had baseball teams. And they wound up playing uh, a European World Series, lots of games that attracted 10,000, 30,000 people to their games. Um, and Sam Nahum was asked to organize a team on his military base in France uh, in a little town called Ois, uh, which is what's on their uh, uniform. So he did that. Most of the members of his team were minor league players. It was, it was he and another major league player on the team. A lot of them had been in college, some had played semi-pro. But he did something very unusual uh, and courageous. Uh, at the time, military, the military in America, American military was racially segregated, and so were its baseball teams. But Sam Nahum, who had been a, a radical in college and continued to be a radical and believed in integration, he uh, insisted that there be black players on his team, and he recruited two Negro League stars who were uh, stationed in France. One of them was uh, Willard Brown, who uh, got into the Hall of Fame later in life, never uh, played one year in the majors, and, uh, and Leon Davis, uh, Leon Day, a, t a pitcher for the, uh, for the uh, Newark uh, Eagles, a uh, Negro League team. Um, and they did really well. They were 17 and one, and they got into the World Series. And the team they were playing was General Patton's team called the Red Circlers. And they had seven or eight major league players on the team. Um, but despite that, in a five game uh, World Series played in France and in Germany, uh, Sam Nahum's team beat General Patton's team with an integrated team. Um, and one of the more interesting sidelights to that is that the final game of the Military World Series where Sam Nahum pitched and uh, his team won the, Internet, the World Series, was played in Nuremberg Stadium in Nuremberg, Germany, which was the site of many of Hitler's uh, Nazi rallies. Uh, but the American soldiers got the, um, got the German prisoners of war to build a baseball field in the middle of this Coliseum, Nuremberg Coliseum Stadium, um, and uh, they changed the name from Nuremberg Stadium to Soldiers Field. And it's a, it's a, a little known, but I think important uh, story. So that, that all laid the groundwork. That was uh, 1945, 1946. Uh, in 1946, Jackie Robinson played for the, minor, for the Brooklyn Dodgers minor league team in Montreal, Canada. And the next year he was brought up to the majors. And while he was a player, and after he was a player, he, he played for the Dodgers from 1947 to 1956. During that whole period, he was a outspoken activist for civil rights. He, um, he spoke out against racism, against segregation, against the second class citizenship of African Americans, against the segregation of the, uh, of the spring training facilities, mostly in Florida at the time. Um, and he uh, was uh, speaking all the time about civil rights to high schools and colleges. Um, he really was the first professional athlete to use his platform to speak out about social justice. And, uh, and after his baseball career was over, um, he became even more engaged. He helped to start a bank in Harlem called Freedom National Bank, which gave loans to black people who were denied loans 
by uh, white owned banks. It's called redlining. Started a construction company for uh, low income housing. He traveled all over the South going with Dr. King uh, to civil rights rallies. He, he raised money for the students who were arrested after the sit-ins in 1960. He was everywhere and he was still among the most popular people in the United States, African-American people in the United States. Um, politicians wanted his endorsement. He was very well known, but he was willing to be controversial for the sake of um, of integration. And he lived a, a remarkable but short life and he died at the age of 53 uh, of both diabetes and a, and a heart condition. Um, the final story I wanna tell about um, integration took place in 1968 and it, it involves two people who have been in the news in the last couple of days. Uh, Roberto Clemente, because it was Roberto Clemente Day on September 15th, and Maury Wells, the great Dodger base dealer who died yesterday. Uh, Dr. King was, uh, was assassinated in Memphis on April 4th, 1968. That was the last day of, um, of uh, a spring training for Major League Baseball. Uh, and the uh, commissioner of baseball, William Eckert, said uh, teams can decide for themselves whether they want to play on the day of um, Dr. King's funeral. Almost every other sport at the time, including racehorsing and hockey, uh, canceled their games to honor Dr. King, but not baseball. Uh, so it was up to each team. Um, and these headlines, baseball postpones traditional openers, makes it sound like baseball uh, postponed their games willingly, but that, that isn't the truth. The headline on the right is the truth. Negro pirates won't play at Houston on Monday. That story is the story of Maury Wells, who at then was uh, an infielder for the Pirates, Roberto Comendi, the first Latino superstar, Don Clendenin, who uh, had been friendly with Martin Luther King's family in Atlanta when he was growing up, and Dave Wickersham, a, a white pitcher for the, for the Pirates. They called, Wills and Clemente and Clendenin, and Clendenin called a meeting of their black teammates. It was the, there were more black players on the Pirates than any other team. And they said, we're not going to play the day of and the day before Dr. King's funeral. They were supposed to play in Houston on those days. And they told the owner of the Pirates and the GM, general manager, we're not going to play. Um, and then they called a meeting of their white teammates, and they unanimously agreed that they would not play on uh, opening day, I'm sorry, on Martin Luther King's funeral day or the day before to honor him. And that idea spread throughout Major League Baseball. And eventually every team had a similar meeting um, and they all agreed, uh, not always unanimously, but they agreed they weren't gonna play on those days. And the owners were furious, but there's nothing they could do about it. Um, and that was in effect a wildcat strike was on a strike over uh, over wages or working conditions or pensions. It was a strike over racial justice. And it's uh, everybody says the first baseball strike was 1972. But in fact, that was a strike over, uh, over justice, over racial justice. And that leads to the next topic, which I'll go through very quickly, which is, you know, we just came through a lockout of Major League Baseball. The owners refused to play the games while they were negotiating a contract with the Baseball Players Union. We sort of take it for granted now that there is a Baseball Players Union, but that wasn't always true. And now, as of last week, there will be a minor league players union, which uh, is something I'll mention in a second. So there were labor wars and baseball was founded and grew uh, in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s, which was a period in American history called the Gilded Age. Uh, a lot of uh, titans, corporate titans, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the Fricks, uh, owned a lot of uh, companies. Uh, they were the wealthiest people in the world uh, at the time. Um, and including JP Morgan, the, the owner of uh, the largest bank in the company. And, um, and these big corporations were sort of riding roughshod over both consumers and over their workers. And that was also true in baseball. The first owners of these major league teams thought of themselves or acted like robber barons in baseball. And the players, um, the players didn't, didn't uh, like that. Um, 
very often the owners would cut their pay in the middle of the season, or they'd make them pay uh, for their uniforms, or they would make them pay for their own meals or their own hotels, and they were they were treated very shabbily. And so in the 1880s, uh, this guy, John Montgomery Ward, who was not only uh, on the New York Giants baseball team, he was an attorney. He, was, he later became a championship golfer. And in 1885, he started the first uh, union of professional athletes called the Brotherhood of Baseball Players in 1885 to challenge what he considered to be the exploitation by owners who suppressed their wages and made them sort of slaves to their team through the reserve clause, which said you, they could be traded without their um, consent um, and they can't bargain uh, with other teams to get a better contract. Uh, so Ward was kind of the, the Moses that led uh, the baseball players uh, out of uh, slavery. At least that's what he hoped to do through a union. And he had help. Uh, and in the book, Major League Rebels, we talk about some of his co-conspirators, uh, Jim O'Rourke, uh, Tim O'Keefe, Mark Baldwin. Uh, and they were all influenced by what was going on at the time in America, which was the rise of the labor movement and strikes and protests. And they, they absorbed that in the larger culture. Uh, and they also gave their support as celebrities to some of the strikes that were going on. Mark Baldwin was a supporter of the Homestead strike outside Philadelphia, outside Pittsburgh, which is where he grew up. Um, and so um, uh, they even started their own baseball players league when the owners wouldn't negotiate a contract. They started their own league called the Players League. It only lasted a year. But it was their way of saying that we are going to uh, control our own destiny. Um, they, they couldn't afford really to start their own league without outside investors. And eventually the owners of Major League Baseball got to those outside investors and got them to, to disinvest. Um, uh, I'm going to skip a few things. Danny Gardella was a player for the uh, New York Giants who sued Major League Baseball uh, over the right to be uh, to, to whether he could be traded or not. He played in Mexico for a couple years in the Mexican League for twice or three times the salary he got for the Giants. But he wanted to come back and take some play, and uh, Major League Baseball had imposed um, a prohibition on anybody who played in Mexico to come back and play in the, uh, in the American or National League. So he sued, uh, and but he couldn't afford to keep paying a lawyer. So he settled the Major League... Uh, Commissioner settled with him, uh, and he won quite a bit of money, uh, but he didn't set a precedent because it never actually got ruled on in court. Um, Sandy Kovacs and Don Drysdale went on strike uh, in the mid-60s uh, to get a better contract. They refused to play during spring training, and that, uh, that opened the eyes of lots of other players who weren't as big as stars as Kovacs and Drysdale. Uh, uh, some of the other players who thought it was time to have a union in Major League Baseball were Robin Roberts and Jim Bunning, two uh, all-star pitchers. And they recruited Marvin Miller to be the first executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association. That players union had existed in the 50s, but it didn't have any staff, didn't have any money, and it was a paper tiger. And it was under Miller that the first collective bargaining agreement in professional sports uh, was, uh, was concluded. Um, he, um, he got better salaries and working conditions and health care benefits through uh, educating and organizing the players in the 1960s and 70s. And then in 1970, after Kurt Flood, a star outfielder for the St. Louis Cardinals, got traded to the Phillies, he said, I don't want to go to Philadelphia. It's, um, it's, a, it's a southern town, a racist town. I've got my family and friends and business opportunities in St. Louis. And he was an all-star. He was a gold glove winner. He didn't want to leave. Uh, and he went to Miller and he said, I don't want to leave. And he said, you have to leave under the contract. And he said, well, can I sue Major League Baseball? And he said, sure, you can sue, but you'll lose. Uh, and he said, I want to do it anyway. And so the Players Union agreed to back his suit. 1970, he sued Major League Baseball over the reserve clause that bit of indentured servitude that, that bound players to their um, to their teams. Uh, two years later, he lost the suit in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled that baseball was 
not a business and it was not an interstate business. Therefore, it did not come under the federal rules about antitrust and collusion that had been passed in the 1890s. And the Supreme Court had ruled in 1922 that baseball was not a business. And the Supreme Court in 1972 upheld that. So uh, uh, Flood lost his lawsuit, but he, he educated the public and he educated the players. It doesn't have to be this way. You know, the things that they had taken for granted, like the reserve clause, maybe we can change it. And Miller figured out how to change it by uh, getting two other players, Andy Messerschmidt and Dave McNally, to play without a contract in 1975. And then at the end of the year, um, basically said, well, we don't, have a, we don't have a contract, so we are now free agents. And uh, uh, an arbitrator, an outside arbitrator, ruled in favor of the players. And that's how the reserve clause, that form of indentured slavery, got overturned. Kurt Floyd, on the other hand, his career was over. He was blacklisted from Major League Baseball, and he never uh, played again, played, played a couple of games, but he never really had a career after that in baseball. Marvin Miller retired after about 15 years of being the head of the Players Union, and he was uh, blacklisted from the Baseball Hall of Fame seven times. Uh, the, the Major League Hall of Fame, which is basically controlled by the corporate owners of baseball, refused to let him in the Hall of Fame until there was a kind of movement, a crusade to get him in by the Players Union and others. And eventually in 2019, uh, on the eighth try, after he had already been dead for six years, uh, the Hall of Fame let him in. Uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic uh, postponed the ceremony where um, he would be inducted posthumously. Uh, and last year he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. But in the last literally month, there's been a whole other uh, story and a whole other wave of unionized, unionizing by minor league players. And that's because a number of minor leaguers uh, formed an organization called Advocates for Minor Leaguers, included some former major leaguers. Uh, most people don't know that minor leaguers have poverty pay, about $20,000 a year, terrible housing conditions. Many have mental health problems because of the conditions. So this article in ESPN in last year was, you know, helped to raise awareness. But in 2014, 40 minor league players sued Major League Baseball for violating federal minimum wage laws. They get less than minimum wage, actually. Um, and that got them angry and they organized. Um, and eventually earlier this year, uh, they won that suit in July and uh, they, Major League Baseball agreed to settle for $185 million uh, to the minor league players. That gave the players a sense, oh, we, we can win, we can do this. And so um, the Major League Baseball Union agreed to organize them back in um, uh, last year, but it didn't get any media attention until a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they joined the AFL-CIO, the, the National Labor Movement. They began talking to players all over the country. There's about 5,000 minor leaguers on 120 teams around the country. Um, and last year, uh, last week, they won. The Major League Baseball agreed to accept the Player Association as the representative and bargaining agent of the 5,000 minor leaguers. Um, part of our book is about um, the role that women have played in baseball. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail about that, except to say that women have always played baseball. I don't mean softball, I mean baseball. Uh, Alta Weiss, Lizzie Murphy were two of the great um, uh, women players against all male teams. Um, in the early 1900s. Uh, the woman on the right, Jackie Mitchell, uh, played for a team, a minor league team called the Chattanooga Lookouts in Tennessee. In an exhibition game, she struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, who were quite embarrassed by that. Um, as soon as she did that, and it got a lot of headlines, Commissioner Landis uh, made a ruling that women could no longer play on minor league teams even though she was the only one at the time. Um, there was the All-American Girls Baseball League, which has been made famous by the film, uh, 1992 film, A League of Their Own. Helen Callahan was uh, one of the star players. Uh, 
that story in the movie was based on her and her sister, who were two players in the um, uh, in the All American Girls Baseball League. Uh, her son Casey Candell is now the bench coach for the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. He was a major leaguer on three different teams in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Gina Davis played uh, the character, one of the characters of the sisters, uh, based not entirely a true story, but based on a true story. Lots of stars. Uh, the, the teams played from 1943 until about 1954. There were about 600 women that played uh, in that league. Um, many of them were gay. Uh, and the, the, uh, the movie, uh, The League of Their Own, did not talk about that. Um, but they did. some of them did come out of the closet after their playing careers were over or in their obituaries. They mentioned that they were living with their partner. We talk about that in, in our book, Baseball Rebels. Um, there were three black women that played uh, in the Negro Leagues. That story is told in the new Amazon told a little bit in the new Amazon TV series, also called A League of Their Own, which came out uh, last month. Tony Stone, Mamie Johnson, and, and Connie Morgan were the uh, the models for the black pitcher uh, uh, called Max in that TV series. Uh, Little League Baseball uh, refused to let girls play until uh, some of them did play by cutting their hair and so forth. And but when they were found out, they were kicked off the teams. But eventually, as, as a result of the women's movement and Title IX and growing awareness, more Little League players, more women, more girls got to play in the Little League. They had to sue, in some cases, to get access to the Little League games. Uh, Renee Davis was a Little League pitcher um, who um, played in the Little League World Series. Uh, and she was the first Little League player to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Uh, and she now plays uh, uh, softball um, for a college team. Uh, Illa Borders was the first woman to get a baseball scholarship to go to a uh, play on an all-male team in, in college. Uh, then she played in the independent minor leagues for four years. She was a pretty good pitcher, uh, not good enough to make the majors. Uh, and she was quite a heroic figure. She wrote a book about her experiences as well. And again, this movie that came out, this TV series, seven-part series, that came out a couple months ago, um, a month and a half ago, tells two stories that weren't told in the original um, League of Their Own. One is um, about the, uh, uh, the sexuality, the, le the number of lesbians, and how they were... Um, in the closet because the teams wanted the players to be all American girls. They didn't want them to be known as lesbians. You know, we don't know how many were lesbians, but many of them were. Uh, and the story about the racism. There were no black players ever in the all American girls uh, professional baseball league. Um, there are um, now black and women sports writers, Claire Smith for the New York Times. I was a woman umpire in the minor leagues who sued she wasn't um, permitted to play in the uh, in the major leagues. Pam Postuma. Uh, there's now a major league coach, and there's several. There's on field coach, and there's other co well, uh, there's strengthening coaches in the majors. Kelsey Whitmore is now a pitcher and outfielder for the minor league Staten Island Ferry Hawks, uh, and uh, she played in Cal State Fullerton. Again, she's playing baseball, not softball. There's now a woman general manager and a minor league manager in, the, in Tampa, uh, who's a woman. Um, there have been, been 20,000 players in the major leagues since 1900. None of them have ever come out as gay. Um, but two of them came out as gay after their careers were over. Glenn Burke and Billy Bean, they both wrote books about it. Glenn Burke died of AIDS, a kind of sordid and uh, tragic story. Billy Bean was hired by uh, Major League Baseball to be a vice president for inclusion and diversity, and he still has that job. And he's doing a great job, actually. Every major league team except the uh, the Texas Rangers now has a pride night. There's a lot of gay people in the executive wing of baseball teams. It's not great, but even so, no major leaguer has still ever come out of the closet, even though 
Um, we know there are gay players, um, but there are players that have played in the minors and come out of the closet, including these three. Uh, there's more than that, but I just mentioned these three. David Denson played uh, in AAA for the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, and just uh, four weeks ago, a minor leaguer named Solomon Bates came out of the, uh, the closet. Um, there were two gay umpires, at least that we know of, who come out of the closet. Gail Scott and Dave Pullo, and they've both written books about that experience. I'm going to uh, skip the role that American baseball has played against militarism and the war in Vietnam and uh, and other uh, American imperialism, American colonialism of Latin America. Um, you can see some of the players. That we talk a lot about it in, in the book, Banjo League Rebels. Um, Roberto Clemente was very outspoken about that. Um, just uh, last week, for the first time in um, uh, Major League history, the Tampa Bay team uh, put a, on the field a t nine Latino players. First time that's ever happened. And uh, the, the book ends with uh, today's uh, rebels. I won't go into a lot of detail. A lot of them were critical of uh, Trump's immigration and uh, asylum policies. Uh, some of them refused to go with uh, uh, the Red Sox and some players on the Washington Nationals and other teams refused to meet with President Trump when they won the World Series on, in protest, um, uh, including these two players for the Astros who refused to go to the White House. Uh, Bruce Maxwell was took a knee, similar to Colin Kaepernick, and his white teammate Mark Kanye uh, kind of uh, put his hand on him to show solidarity. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Kanye uh, made a statement on his uh, Twitter feed about Pride Night and gay rights, uh, which has been very outspoken. Sean Doolittle has been very outspoken on lots of issues that we talk about in the book. Uh, Mookie Betts and Dave Kapler took knees in support of Black Lives Matter, as did many other players. And finally, um, the one one remaining issue in Major League Baseball that I think needs to be addressed is are the sweatshop uh, conditions in the factory um, in Costa Rica, where all 1.2 million baseballs that are used in Major League Baseball are manufactured. That you can see a picture of the factory right there. Um, the the uh, the workers uh, get serious physical problems, carpal tunnel syndrome. It's very tough to sew a baseball, uh, and, they, and they do have to do it under enormous pressure and speed. A couple of years ago, Major League Baseball bought a quarter interest in the Rawlings company, and therefore, Major League Baseball, there are 30 teams, 25 of them are billionaires. Major League Baseball owns a sweatshop in Costa Rica, uh, and it wouldn't cost them very much money to improve the working conditions improve the pay, uh, and to make it easier for these workers to uh, improve their lives. Um, and hopefully uh, the Players Association uh, and others will draw attention to this, uh, this real tragedy and abuse that still rem hovers over Major League Baseball. And we talk about that in some detail in our, um, in our book. Um, so uh, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, and uh, feel free, if you have any questions, to email me. My name is Peter Dreyer. You can look up my name. And I teach at Occidental College in Los Angeles, where you can find my email address. Um, I'd like to thank the archives for, for doing this. It's very generous of them. I've been a big fan of the archives for many years. I've used the archives. Um, at the Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, the LBJ Library, when I was doing some research. Um, it's been a real privilege to work with the archives on making this presentation. And uh, I appreciate your attention. And uh, if you're interested in following up and learning more about the things I raised in this talk, I hope you'll buy the two books, Baseball Rebels and Major League Rebels. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure.